Okay, I had uh, thought that I would be done with more or less a significant part of theory in the last class and then actually start semiconductors today. But I think there will be one more point I would like to cover uh, in this lecture. And probably we'll take up the details of semiconductors itself from the next lecture onwards, perhaps. Um, what I want to deal with is the idea of electron diffraction. and band discontinuities. We've seen some of these things in various ways. I want to put a sort of finishing touch to it. So as we go into semiconductors, discontinuities, I hope I've spelled that right. Uh, we need these ideas sort of to really understand the band picture of semiconductors in particular. We've spent a lot of time in the metals so far. And as we go into semiconductors, I want to use this lecture sort of as a bridge in the theory that why is it that there are uh, band discontinuities, energy gaps in semiconductors, but are there actually such gaps in metals? Uh, and uh, what is the difference between them in terms of electron diffraction? We saw uh, earlier that uh, for, a, for, a freely, uh, for an electron moving in free space, we could express the wave function as a psi has got a spatial <coughs> component and a temporal component. And we had expressed that as exponential j kx minus omega t. This was our wave function for an electron moving in free space. And just if you look at its spatial component, how does it vary with x? It's a traveling wave that has got the following format, simply exponential j kx. For such a wave, k was the wave vector given by 2 pi by lambda. And its momentum was simply h bar k. Now, in certain cases, though this is strictly speaking true only for the electron in free space, say for an electron that is moving within a certain band inside a metal, we could probably use the same idea. Why? Inside a metal or inside a crystal, to be more general, we would said that the potential energy term is zero. Right? They're freely moving within there. But outside the crystal, it's going to be very large. And under these circumstances, and for electron motion within a given band, it is not moving across bands, we could still approximate the wave function by the same kind of a traveling wave function as if it is in free space. And in that case, the same wave function can be written where we'll write A exponential some magnitude we have amplitude of the wave, <coughs> excuse me, exponential j k x. So even for such an electron, though it is not in free space, its spatial component can be expressed in the same way where a is the amplitude of the wave, which we kind of ignored in the previous case, and obviously k becomes the wave vector inside the crystal. So as long as it is moving in a band inside the crystal, we can apply this. For such an electron, we note that this wave function that we have written is also then a solution, a possible solution of the Schrodinger equation. Okay? And in that case, then, we can say that its energy is given by h bar k whole squared by 2 me. We saw this also earlier. The energy of the electron is given by this momentum as before, given by h bar k. That's simply p squared by 2m term. Okay? So such a wave that has been expressed by this simple waveform, wave function, is a traveling wave propagating through, throughout the crystal. But there's one problem, is that will it do this for all values of k? In other words, can I have uh, arbitrary values for e? 
And we'd seen earlier, looking at other ideas, that there is discontinuities. There are only certain numbers. And we can explore that same idea in terms of the wave behavior of an electron, namely that a wave can undergo transmission as well as reflection. So if the reflected waves, so treating the electron as a wave, we now have that there are reflected waves too. In their interaction with the ions or the cores of the uh, crystal, the electrons behaving as a wave can undergo reflection. Under certain conditions, the reflected waves could interfere and we could end up with diffraction. Okay? Constructive interference. They all add up under certain conditions. And we'll see, we'll take it up a little more. But this is the basic <coughs> idea. So I'm coming to that. But basically, as one wave is coming back from one interaction with one core, then the next, the part of that wave is propagated. From the next ion core also, we're going to get a reflected wave. And from the next ion core also, we're going to get a reflected wave. And all these reflected waves are now propagating in the opposite direction to the electron wave propagation. The different waves that are coming back, the reflected waves, could all add up constructively or destructively. When they add up constructively, we get a tremendous reflected wave. It's a constructive interference, which we call diffraction. Right? And in that case, we say that the electron does not propagate because most of it is getting reflected back. Okay? That's the basic idea of electron diffraction when we treat the electron as a wave. I'll take that up for a simple case. In other words, what we're saying is that there could be some values of this K for which we get a reflected wave that is very strong. It's all added up constructively. All the separate components of the reflected wave have added up very strongly, and the wave, the electron wave that is moving in this direction does not propagate anymore. Okay? So that's the general idea that we're going to explore, first of all, in one dimension, and then we'll extend that idea further. Just let's start with a one-dimensional lattice, which we'll draw very simply as consisting of a set of atoms or ion cores, whichever way you look at it, that are separated by a distance A. Okay? And we label these as A, B, C, and so on. In this case, because it's a one-dimensional lattice, when we talk of diffraction, Fundamentally, it's the same as talking about reflection. It's just going to reflect as if it's just reflecting and come back. Okay? So we're going to consider the propagation of a wave, the electron wave, that is. Okay? Don't get confused as we did with phonons where the atoms were vibrating. We're talking of the propagation of a wave, the electron wave, whose wave function was expressed earlier, through this one-dimensional chain. And we can say the length of this chain is L. So this is our conditions under which we are moving. The wave function propagating is psi k, and it is moving in the forward direction x that we will define as follows. I'll redraw this now to show that for when the electron comes here, or the wave comes here, it sets up a reflected wave at A, which we will call A dash. And similarly, reflected wave at B will be referred to as B dash and so on. And the amplitude of the wave is simply A dash, let's say. It has some amplitude with which it is being reflected. So when we look at this, and I draw it again for you, we've got a series of reflected waves that will come for the same sort of iron core, separation of A, small a that is, I'm showing the uh, forward direction wave as propagating in this direction. And when it came to A, it has undergone a reflection. Okay? Part of the wave propagated on here, but part of it is getting reflected. And we'll do just a schematic idea here. This is the reflected wave A dash. 
This wave is the wave that is traveling in the forward direction. Similarly, when it came to B, it is undergoing a reflection, and we're getting a reflected wave B dash, and so on, that is C dash. Okay? And now the question is, under what conditions will A dash, B dash, and C dash interfere constructively? If we know that, then we will have the answer to a question, for what values of K will the electron wave propagate through this crystal? So basically we have to identify for what conditions A dash, B dash, C dash, and so on interfere constructively. The path difference between these should be n lambda for constructive interference. Okay? Now we also know that the electron, the wave that is coming after reflection from B, with respect to the reflected wave A at coming off of A, has traveled an additional 2A. Are you with me on that? The wave that is coming back and meeting this wave at A has traveled A in this direction and A back. So it has actually traveled an additional path to A. So we've got that the actual difference between these two waves in terms of their path length is 2A, and we also have the condition for constructive interference that it should be n lambda. So we can immediately set up that the condition that we require is that 2A is equal to n lambda for constructive interference. All right? Now I can make a substitution. I know that lambda is equal to 2 pi by k. We had written it earlier as k is equal to 2 pi by lambda. It's the same thing. I know this idea. For where I can make a substitution then into the previous equation for lambda. So doing that, we get 2a is equal to n times 2 pi by k. which we can rewrite then in terms of k is equal to n pi by a. All right? These, where n is simply a set of integers 1, 2, 3, and so on. I have identified certain values of k where I might even specify that it is related to n by putting a subscript k subscript n to say that there are specific values of, wave of, of k that are integral multiples of this pi by a term, at which we would expect this behavior to take place where they will all add up constructively. And we have said earlier that when they all add up constructively, that is where we are getting electron diffraction, or in this case, electron reflection. That means the wave is no longer propagating. So we have identified it, the, uh, a, a set of conditions that are very important for the following discussion into 2D and 3D. There are specific values of K for which the electron will not propagate. We can write then also that there is a wave that is going in the reverse direction, the reflected wave, whose wave function can simply be expressed as psi minus K is equal to A exponential minus JKX. It's basically the same kind of a wave except it's propagating in the opposite direction. So this is the wave function for the reflected wave or the backward wave. Well, what happens to this wave? We said that when we had a wave with the wave function psi kx, a exponential plus jkx, as it moved down the linear chain, it underwent a reflection at certain values of k and got reflected back, which we called our electron diffraction. Well, for a moment, think only of the reflected wave. What happens to it? Will it go on propagating too? Given that its wave function is this, what could we expect of it? it perfectly, right? The same thing that happened to a wave with the positive sign here going in this direction now, except it's going in the other direction, the same thing can happen. It goes some reflected, 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 
reflected components adding up constructively under the same conditions where k subscript n is equal to n pi by a. And we can have, again, the wave is going this way. So we've got now two sets of waves, both capable of going one forward and backward, forward and backward. They're just reflecting back and forth. What does that tell you? What kind of a wave is that? Standing waves. Very good. Very good. We've created standing waves. They are identical waves propagating in opposite directions with nodes and anti-nodes at the exactly same places. So we've created what are called standing waves. Remember, the wave function that we wrote here was for a traveling wave. The electron is moving through the crystal. Now we end up that under certain conditions, instead of a traveling wave, we've ended up with a standing wave. That means the electron is not propagating anymore. It is vibrating around some mean position, but it's not propagating through the crystal. So for certain k values, because of this interaction with the iron core and the reflected wave that is set up, we are going to get standing waves where there is no propagation of the crystal. At other values of k, the electron can propagate. So this is the condition where we set up standing waves that kn is equal to n pi by a. So now I've got my two waves that I can write, uh, uh, just to put it together here. And these are going to interfere constructively. All right? There's two things that can happen to this set of waves. Either we can add them or we can subtract them. And in that process, we will set up psi k plus psi minus k or psi k minus psi minus k, constructive and destructive kind of behaviors. So these are the two possibilities that could take place. We can uh, more explicitly write that, that in the first case, we have a new wave function then which we will label as psi subscript c as a function of x is equal to a exponential j k x plus a exponential minus j k x. And what will that give us? A cosine <coughs> n, n pi. Yeah, we express it as n pi x upon a. We're substituting for k there. And we get this n pi x upon a for certain specific values where the k n values are there. Okay? So when n is, k is equal to n pi by a, we're getting this condition where these two waves have added up like this. This is one important wave that we'll have to keep in mind. The other one is the opposite case, which we will label as psi subscript s as a function of s uh, as a function of x, as a exponential j k x minus a exponential minus j k x, and in this case we will end up with a s sine n pi x upon a. So these are two wave functions that have been generated. They are the standing waves that are involved due to this interference between the forward wave and the reflected wave. Now what we can do is to take their, to find out the probability density function, the modulus of the square of these. That will give me the probability psi squared, right? So we can write then that psi c squared gives me the probability density function most likely where I will find the nodes and anti-nodes for such a case. And similarly, we get for this two. And if we were to plot these with respect to the iron core positions, we find that in one case, the maxima is right over the ions. Okay? That's the case for psi c squared. And in this case, the other case, the opposite case, we get that the maxima is passing through these.
So in between them we get the maximum likelihood of finding the electron. Right? So now the probability density function psi squared is a maximum between these two ion cores. Here the probability density function is at a maximum at the ion core. Those are the two cases that have been generated by looking at it. These two wave functions also that we have generated, this one and this one, also satisfy the Schrodinger equation. Now we want to know in terms of energy, we've got a wave functions at these discontinuities where something called electron diffraction or reflection is taking place. We've got the probability density distributions just schematically. And now what we want to know is what's the difference in energy between these two wave functions? There are two solutions that we have now. And is there any difference in energy between these two? Well, in terms of their kinetic energy, what can we say about the two forms? Why? He said they're equal, but why? What's the kinetic energy term? In terms of K? We just wrote that earlier. P squared by 2M, right? Half MV squared, whatever we express, but in terms of K, you can you can derive this, right? E is equal to the, you, you should be able to get this. So we get in terms of K or the momentum wave vector, we have this expression. So if this is the values that we should get for kinetic energy, would the kinetic energy of both these wave functions be same? Pardon? K is same for both. Very good. K is same for both. We're talking at a specific value of K subscript N. Namely, K is equal to pi by A, 2 pi by A, and in each of these cases, they are the identical values of K. So identical at identical values of K, or K subscript N, we've got the same energy, kinetic energy. So there's no difference in the kinetic energy component of these two wave functions. But what about for their potential energy? Is there any difference between the two? <coughs> Excuse me. You know that the potential energy term is expressed as for the electrostatic interaction. What can you say between these two waves? Think in terms of what is the R that I have written in this equation. Everything else is simply a constant. E squared, 4 pi, epsilon naught, they're all standard constants. So there's obviously no difference. If any difference at all could be there, it will be because of a difference between these two wave functions in our interpretation of the value of R. What is R? We're talking of the distinction between where is the electron and where is the ion core? That is the interaction, right? The electrostatic interaction. So in these two cases, is there any difference? Right? We look at the probability density functions. That tells me the most likely location of the electron, the highest probability of finding it. And in this case, the highest probability of finding it is close to this. Basically above it is how we have drawn it. Whereas in this case, it is at this distance, A by 2, away from it. You see the difference? Don't think of this is so far away and this is close by. That's an easy mistake to make. What this is plotting is the most likely location of the electron in along A. Here, the most likely location is at this point here. Whereas here, the most likely location is at this, this distance away. So in this second case, the R that I have in this equation is larger. For psi C, the R that I use is a smaller value. So if R is smaller, what would be true of the electrostatic potential energy? R is 
Negative sign. Potential energy will be lower. <coughs> Magnitude is larger. Potential energy is lower because of the negative sign. So when R is larger, that means in the psi C case, I'm sorry, in the psi S case, am I right on that? Yeah, potential energy is lower when R is lower. Where is my size C, 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 C? Okay. So that's what we are saying is that the potential energy term in the size C case is lower than the potential energy term in the size S case. Right? So we've got now that the kinetic energy term is identical for both, whereas the potential energy term in one case is lower than the other. So overall, we would expect for these two wave functions that one would give us a lower energy value at Kn than the other situation. We can show, without going into the full details of it, that the potential energy term Vc for the wave function psi c can be expressed by 1 by L L is the length of the linear chain, Vx times psi Cx whole squared dx. Probability of finding it in a length dx times the potential integrated over the whole length. And this can be simply written as minus V subscript n, not going into the details. Basically, the point by putting the subscript n is that this is also a function of that k term, which itself is a function of n. Okay? So the potential energy term in this case at such a discontinuity is related to the k and therefore is expressed as minus Vn. Now, similarly, we would write that for the psi s term, we have that the potential energy is expressed similarly. We will do it and get plus Vn. Okay, that's the basic difference. And remember, I told you that the Vc term, potential for the C, was going to be lower than that for N. So now I've got that the kinetic energies are expressed as H bar K whole squared by 2M. And in each of these cases now, the potential energies are given by either minus Vn or plus Vn. So I can write the total energy in each case is equal to h bar k whole squared by 2 me, the kinetic energy term, minus Vn. And for the E, for the S wave function, we have got h bar k whole squared, the same term again, plus Vn. And this is for values of k that are n pi by so there's only two specific energy values that we have, which are solutions that satisfy for these specific k values. There's only two energy values that will satisfy the equations, Schrodinger equations. There's no other values in between it that are allowed. Okay? Just these two values we have. And in one case, we have ES being higher than EC. So we'll write that ES minus EC, the separation between these two points at k, is given by 2 Vn. Right? Vn and Vn. So 2 Vn we have. This is going to be the separation between the two energy values at the specific values of k where diffraction is taking place. For all other values of k, that is when k is not equal to n pi by a, we simply get that the energy is the kinetic energy. It's moving freely as if it is not seeing anything else there, not undergoing the diffraction. So in these cases, it is propagating through the crystal, but at specific, when it possesses a specific value of k or a specific momentum, it undergoes diffraction. Now, it is, we have sort of made it that it is strictly at these values of k that this electron diffraction is taking place. But actually, the interaction starts in some region around the iron core. In other words, what I've done is I've got the iron core here. 
I have drawn it that it's coming and exactly here it is getting reflected. Well, it is getting reflected. The interaction is taking place not specifically at this value, but also at some areas before it and after it. So we have to modify our picture slightly, namely that the discontinuity or the distortion in the picture will take place at some values around k is equal to n pi by a, not specifically exactly at it, but there will be some region around it where this distortion will take place. Okay? So we know now that k is equal to n pi by a, there is distortion around it. We can combine these two ideas to draw an E versus k diagram that will look like this. I'll try to draw it in a reasonably decent way so I don't confuse you. <clears throat> Here we have the first point of discontinuity where n is equal to 1. That's k, that's e, and that's minus k. Similarly here, minus pi a. And then around that, we have now uh, the discontinuity like this. Where the second one will be for n is equal to 2, where we'll get <coughs> 2 pi by a. And we get a similar idea here. minus 2 pi by a. You see that it is getting distorted from its parabolic shape as we approach n, not exactly at n that there is a sharp change, but as we approach that particular value of k, we are getting the distortion taking place. And for different values like this. So here is the value for E, C or E, S? E, S. That's the higher energy, right? And that is the value of energy for E, C. And the difference between these two? In this case, N is equal to 1 here, right? So simply 2V1. And similarly here, we get another one where the difference is 2V2. Okay, So here we've got a picture, even in a metal, where that there are certain values of k at which electron diffraction is taking place. All we've done is consider a one-dimensional linear model and shown that there is certain values of k at which the band picture E versus k diagram is getting distorted. And we have no wave propagation because we set up standing waves there. We can show the same thing in a more conventional fashion if I draw it here, perhaps you should be able to see it, but if not, you tell me. These are my various bands of allowed energies, and then there are places where there is no allowed value of energy because that at that point of k there is going to be the electron diffraction or reflection. So this, this range is a gap. And we have for different values of n, we have such gaps that are set up in the crystal for different values of k as we look at it. Okay? There are some specific names given to this. The region between minus pi by a and plus pi by a is referred to as the first Brillouin zone. And similarly, the region between minus pi by a to minus 2 pi by a on this side and plus pi by a to plus 2 pi by a is known as the second Brillouin zone.
these are two and there are names like this that are given. So that will be my first Brillouin zone. And then both sides of it, we've got the second Brillouin zone. And what the Brillouin zone boundaries, if I draw, indicate are the points at which I've got discontinuities. So at the first Brillouin zone, I've got a discontinuity between the first allowed set of energies and the next allowed set of energy, and so on. We can extend these ideas now that we've obtained it in 1D into 2D and 3D. All right. We have to consider just a linear model. We can extend this into 2D and 3D. It, uh, if we can see it for 2D, I think we'll be able to see it for 3D. 3D is harder to draw and picture. So we'll just look at 2D, but the idea is very easy to extend into 3D also once you grasp it. Now, to draw a 2D <laughs> lattice here, we are going to make use of 2D Miller indices. Okay, you know Miller indices, and when I use 2D Miller indices, I'm going to talk of directions like 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. We've dropped the third subscript because we're talking only in two dimensions, right? The third number we've dropped. And here also the same kind of rules apply, namely that perpendicular, the, the 1, 0 plane is perpendicular to the 1, 0 direction. The 0, 1 planes are perpendicular to the 0, 1 directions, and so on. The same kind of ideas we can do. And so we may draw a coordinate system that will look like this. This we will call the 1, 0, as if it's like the x direction. This we will call the 0, 1 direction. And then this will be the 1, 1 direction at 45 degrees to either of these. This is our coordinate system which we're going to draw a two-dimensional lattice. So how it can be perpendicular to any plane because we have only one plane. Just it, it's two dimensions. So. Uh, All right. It, instead of talking of planes, there's linear chains. The same idea. I mean, instead of thinking of uh, there being a plane in this way, we are talking simply of a flat two D surface. You're right. Think of it as there are linear chains that are perpendicular to each of these. So if this is one zero direction then my one zero chains, instead of talking of planes, now we're talking of chains, are lying this way, perpendicular to this. And my zero one chains lie like this. And one one chains lie perpendicular to these. Right? Just by analogy with 3D. In 3D, we'll talk of actual planes that are there. Here, because we're restricted, as you point out, to 2D, we're talking simply of linear chains that are there. But this is the basic picture. Let's draw a two-dimensional lattice quickly. We have followed the same coordinate system that I drew earlier. And in this case, we've got again 1, 0, 0, 1, and <coughs> 1, 1. So it's obvious that my 1, 0 chains are these, my 0, 1 chains are these, and my 1, 1 chains are these. So the first thing we can say here is that the Spacing between the one zero chains is what? Let's say A. And the spacing between the zero one chains is also A. We've drawn a square lattice. On the other hand, the spacing between the one one chains is different. The one one chains lie like this. So in that case, we are talking of this spacing. Then in this case, it is simply A by root 2. We can show if this is A and this is A, then we can show that it is simply half the, the diagonal for that square, right? So this is the information we have about such an array. Now we are going to consider an electron propagating through this crystal, two-dimensional crystal. 
There's two things that will affect the diffraction. One, as before, the k value. What k value does it have? At specific k values, k is equal to n pi by a, we can expect diffraction. Secondly, the thing that will affect it will be what is the spacing here between planes? In other words, my, my a there that I used earlier was the spacing between these chains. So if it's propagating down this way, then I, it's no longer this a. I have to take into account the spacing between these two as a by root 2. So in, in, it will not be a simple relationship as k is equal to n pi by a. I've got a directional term to it that will account for the change in the spacing between these planes. So these are the two things that we have to keep in mind. And we can write any k vector in terms of its components along these directions. Now for an electron that is propagating with its k vector that is along 1, 0, which has a k vector of k1 along 1, 0, will undergo reflection when? When k1 is equal to plus minus n pi by a. If it is propagating along 1, 0, whenever it has a k1, is equal to n pi by a. So the, uh, for a wave that is propagating with its uh, k2, that is along 0, 1, whenever it has got k value equal to plus minus n pi by, remember your lattice, this is along 1, 0, this is along 0, 1. So what will the value be here? Same, because they are essentially <coughs> separated by a there. I consider k3, which is propagating along the 1, 1. And in that case, what we have, exactly, we'll get a a by root 2 term. k3 is equal to plus minus n pi root 2 by a. a by root 2 is the these are the three conditions for your, your understanding, that there are different directions. We get different conditions for which diffraction is going to occur. <coughs> I can write it very generally for some arbitrary theta. That it's making with these. Right? Uh, this is the incoming electron. Diffracted beam is coming this way. And I can write a very general expression as 2a sine theta, we are not deriving it here, is equal to n lambda. Do you recognize this expression? What is it? Bragg's law. Very good. Bragg's law applies not only to x-rays, but it applies to electrons and other things too. And here we can make the substitution for lambda as 2 pi by k. And what do we get? 2a sine theta is equal to n times 2 pi by k. And solving this in terms of k sine theta, we get n pi by a. Right? Again, we've expressed it now. The only difference between our previous case was that there was no sine theta term there. k was equal to n pi by a. Here, to take into account that there is a directionality, we are writing k sine theta is equal to n pi by a. If it is perpendicular and theta is equal to 90 degree, then you've simply got the previous expression. Plotting for this one, an E versus K diagram, we now have, let's say, for uh, the K1. So if I plot E versus K1, I get something like this. Oops. At what? Pi by A. And corresponding to that, my adjacent picture will be of the more standard representation. There's some gap here. For K2 also, it will be exactly the same because it's again n pi by A, and so we'll get exactly the same thing. But what about for K3? If I plot for K3 now, the E versus K, I find that the discontinuity is at some other point root 2 pi by a. <coughs> right? We, we had seen that earlier, that k3 should show its discontinuity at plus minus 
n pi root 2 by a. Obviously, now this value root 2 pi by a is larger than pi by a which we had for k 1 and k 2. And in this case, when I draw my figure in the other format, okay, here it is for k 3 we are showing along the 1 1 direction and so on. Now, for the overall solid which consists of all these directions, the band picture that will develop is a combination of all these. And in simple terms, if I want to look in this case, we will say that I will add up this one and this one. It is not drawn on the same scale, but you can get the picture if I add up this to this. And in metals particularly, what we have is the following, almost exactly like what we drew earlier. Suppose for a set of directions, I am not drawing, but it is the overall, you will get the picture there. We have this for one of the directions or two of the directions, and we have this picture for the other direction, and we can sum these two to give me, or two or three or four or whatever it is, to give me an overall picture. And this time, what happens when we draw it? Okay, and then we have this one coming up to here. Is there a band gap? Right? We started that for each of these directions there were band gaps, but the overall picture shows no band gap. In other words, an electron that is propagating in a metal like this, even though there are band gaps, discontinuities in particular directions, when it encounters such a discontinuity, all it needs to do is to change its direction, it will find an allowed value. It can go in another direction and find an allowed value. There is no forbidden gaps, no forbidden energy values because it can just simply change direction and acquire the higher energy. It can go on accelerating, in other words. So that is why we see that in metals, though, for particular directions, the same E versus K diagrams will show us discontinuities. In the overall picture that we consider, there are no discontinuities. And this explains for us why metals behave the way they do, even though there are in, in their specific directions, we've got band discontinuities. On the other hand, We've got, for semiconductors and insulators, something that will look a little different. And I'll draw that here. Let's say something like this. All this is schematic, mind you. I mean, the actual picture is a little different. And I'm going to add up these two. So we get levels till here, all filled up, and then there is this gap. Oops, I missed the gap somewhere. This line shouldn't be here. Okay, I made a mistake. That middle line shouldn't be there. In other words, the overlapping of all these leads to a gap that is formed 
in the overall band picture. And the actual magnitude of this gap will determine whether it is a semiconductor or an insulator. So, the basic difference that we are seeing is that in all of these cases, there is the E versus K, e versus K discontinuities, certain forbidden values of K that the electron cannot acquire, except that in metals, because of the overlap in different directions, the electron is able to move on in some other direction and acquire that K value and correspondingly that energy value, whereas in the case of uh, semiconductors and insulators, we end up with a forbidden area due to the overall picture having some gap and the magnitude of the gap gives us the value that is there for a particular semiconductor or insulator. Uh, I won't go into much more in this because that will lay us the foundation when we go to semiconductors now to understand the band gap and the differences there between why metals behave the way they do in semiconductors. You studied that in at least in some measure and we look in more details. Uh, I'll just mention one thing called the Fermi surface. We don't have to go in great detail here either. Fermi surface is simply an energy surface that we draw in free in uh, in K space. Corresponding to Fermi energy. How does the Fermi energy change with K? And in 2D, it is just a planar figure. In 3D, it's a, a three-dimensional. You know, there's a there's a surface to it. I'll give you one simple, two simple examples of what I mean. If this is the first Brillouin zone, plus pi by a, minus pi by a, along 0, 1, and 1, 0, we'll draw a line which denotes the Fermi surface. That means all values up to this are filled. Okay? Here we'll get our first discontinuity. So in some material, the Fermi surface is here. It could be larger. It could be smaller. But in this case, the Fermi surface is lying completely within the first Brillouin zone. This is my first Brillouin zone, and this is the Fermi surface, which is full at 0 k. So all values of E are occupied up to there. This is the picture that we have for simple metals like lithium, sodium, potassium, and so on. In the case of other materials, for example, I'll give you one more. In the case of semiconductors, the first Brillouin zone is like this. The second Brillouin zone will be drawn like this. And in this case, only the first Brillouin zone is full, what we call a valence band. And the second Brillouin zone is empty. We find the discontinuity where? Along these directions. This is the second Brillouin zone. This is the first Brillouin zone. So where we find the discontinuity is at values of pi by a. That's where these two touch each other, same as for the figure earlier. This is an important picture when we want to understand, say, the electrical and magnetic properties of different materials. I'll just leave that for you to uh, ponder over. We may use it later, but I just wanted to introduce that. Okay, we'll stop here, and we'll take up more in detail about semiconductors the next time.